so good afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity to present our, our work here. So um, the, the outline of my talk is the following. So I think um, I will talk a rather about a rather simple method, exact diagonalization. So the conceptual part will be very short, but I will tell you a little bit about the possibilities, <coughs> like in terms of matrix dimensions and what kind of tricks one have to look at. So, so there will be some um, so that you have an idea if you're doing Hamiltonian truncation, what are the limits of matrices you, you in principle can achieve, just to have an idea. And then I would like to, to present you some uh, results on, on our um, own study of Hamiltonian truncation of the phi to the fourth here in one plus one dimension. So our history was that we, we came across the paper by Lorenzo and Slava, two, two, uh, bit more than two years ago, and we realized that we had technology to, to work on that as well. So we tried to give our own, own shot at it, and so we will report about some of the results. And so the main um, point is basic that we're, we're using um, um, somewhat larger Hilbert space sizes, and we extrapolate and then use some finite size scaling analysis to, to come up with an with a independent estimate for the critical point, I think, which is in close agreement with the most recent ones by Slava and uh, one with the previous uh, speaker. <coughs> and so, and de depending on how far I, I get uh, with this, um, I might also talk a little bit about some torus energy spectra, which we have obtained using lattice models, so which are not true quantum field theories, but which we tune to, their, to some uh, prob uh, believed conformal fixed points, and we look at torus energy spectra, and I might show you that, that um, these torus energy spectra are actually useful as fingerprints, um, in numerical simulations at least of lattice models, we can use them as fingerprints to diagnose the CFT by, by just identifying what the spectrum is and matching it with the catalog of established um, theories. And uh, in one of the applications, it might also be that, that one can actually read off from the, from the torus energy spectrum at least the, the sign of, of coupling constants um, for example, of some perturbations, which usually are not so easy to get. So that, that may be one of the, the points uh, there. So <coughs> let me start by just giving a, a very short um, introduction or a, or a kind of a, um, a listing of possibilities for exact diagonalization. So in exact diagonalization, as we heard yesterday, um, this is a conceptually simple uh, method. It's just matrix quantum mechanics, as it has been called. So we're, we're trying to solve the time-dependent um, Schrödinger equation, H psi equals E psi. Um, and so we, we want to solve um, eigenvalues for, this, for these problems, and we, this problem lives in a Hilbert space of a certain dimension. And the question is a bit under what circumstances can you read what type of, of, um, of matrices. So um, if you're just working kind of um, with, with um, matrices which for some reason are completely full, um, so you just have a matrix which says her Hermitian and, and there, there are a lot of entries everywhere, so that's what we call a dense matrix. Then um, one would uh, typically um, have to store the complete matrix, obviously, and that already puts some constraints of what you can actually store simply as a, as a numerical matrix. And so if you have a matrix which is completely full and you want to solve it, then th there are ways using, many of you know that, LAPAC libraries or, or parallel ones, ScalaPAC. And then what you can do in terms of, of um, linear dimensions of the matrix, of the dimension, is then uh, for a, is of the order of, of 10 to the 6. So roughly a million. That's what you can do using supercomputers for complete diagonalization So, so I think typically what one can do on a workstation is a few 10,000, so 10 to the 4 or a few of them. But if it's really a super important problem, you can, you can put um, these matrices on a supercomputer. And for example, with, with libraries like ScalaPack, Uh, on a distributed memory machine, you, you can diagonalize um, up to roughly a million. I mean, we did something of the order of 800,000, um, and probably if one has an even larger machine or more computing time, one can probably go to up a million roughly. So that's just the, the limit. If you, for some reason, you have a completely full matrix, that's about what you can do. Um, if, and also, if you want to have all, all eigenvalues, um, that, that's about. So the question is then, is that all you, you, you can do? So if you're doing, for example, this Hamiltonian truncation, um, ca can we treat larger problems if you're interested, for example, only in a, in a part of the spectrum? 
And um, so if, we're, if you're only interested in low-lying states, a few of them, then I guess also many of you know that there is a, a, an algorithm which is very prominent, which is called the Lanzos um, algorithm. So that's an iterative method where you start with a, a random starting state in your Hilbert space, and then you basically build a Krilov space, um, which basically is a space of, of your starting state, one power of the Hamiltonian applied to the starting state, and, and then subsequent power. And the Lanzos algorithm is a particular way to create, uh, to, to uh, have a, a projection of the Hamiltonian into that Krilov subspace where the Hamiltonian has a three diagonal form. So that by itself is not spectacular, but it's interesting that if you look at, at the spectrum of the, of the projected Hamiltonian, which just lives in a, in a Krilov space, which is as large as the number of iterations you have done, then the extremal eigenvalues, so the bottom and the top one, they converge exponentially quickly to the, the true um, eigenstate, eigenenergies of the, of the complete problem. So if we can use this Lanzos algorithm because we're only interested in states at the boundary of the spectrum, that's already good because um, um, first of all, it basically means that the number of matrix vector multiplications we have to do is, um, is not that large. It does not, it's not as large as the number of uh, the dimension of your problem. So that's, that's already um, helpful. Um, yeah, because the, the convergence is then quite large. And then also if you, um, since the only requirement which the algorithm asks from you, from the physics kind of point of view, is just to provide an application of the matrix of the Hamiltonian onto a vector. It's not, it's not uh, requiring that you have your matrix lying in memory and it's going like, like Gauss algorithms working on your matrix and, and update it in order to get the value out, but it just requires you application of the Hamiltonian onto a vector. And, and so basically what the Lanzos algorithm really requires um, is basically something like two to three to four um, vectors in your Hilbert space. I mean, two to three to four, that depends on what precisely you want. If you have a real symmetric matrix and you only want to know energies, then two vectors are sufficient. If you need an eigenvector in addition, you, you need to, have to allocate one vector more to, to get the result of the eigenvector. And for stability reasons, if you have a Hermitian problem and not a real symmetric one, you might actually have three vectors to run energies and the fourth for the ground state. So that's, yeah. And, um, <coughs> and so the question is, what, what have I done with the matrix? Um, now it, now it depends on the, on the physical problem. Um, what, what can we do? Because in, in principle, um, I guess it's fastest if you can actually um, calculate the matrix and, and store it in memory. If that still fits on your computer, that's probably the, still the fastest way to go. But there might be applications where, where, um, where this is not feasible. Like for example, uh, yeah. So we, we want to explore what, um, what possibilities there are. And so, <coughs> Um, so, so there, there is this method which we call like um, on, on the fly. So we, uh, if we calculate the matrix elements on the fly, which means we have an efficient uh, representation of our basis, and we also know what different parts of the Hamiltonian, how they act on our basis states, and we do that in a very efficient way, that's, uh, that's very um, helpful. But of course, that requires some investment that this is done very quickly because in each iteration, you will do that job again because you somehow trade um, memory so that you're not using memory to save the matrix, but you trade in for computing time. But sometimes that's, an, that's a kind of a compromise you're willing to do. Um, yeah, and, and, um, and I mean, for the problem I'm going to talk about later for the Hamiltonian truncation problem of, of the phi to the four theory, we are actually, I think as many others, we are actually storing the matrix on a, on a computer because at least right now, it's still quite expensive to calculate the matrix elements also because there are a lot of them, uh, but we store them in a sparse matrix format. So that, that's important. I will tell you what the sparse matrix format, I mean, not the form itself, but why do we have a sparse matrix? So the, the reason is basically is that the, the Hilbert space um, 
as we have heard, so the Hilbert space is typically, typically exponential, say in the volume or as we heard in the cutoff or something. So the Hilbert space itself is, is large, um, is exponentially large. But, but on the other hand, you can ask, looking at the structure of Hamilt your Hamiltonian, you can basically ask if you take any basis state, you can ask how many terms are there in your Hamiltonian, um, which can actually have a finite matrix element with this state another and then you're basically asking how many non-zero entries are there in a certain line a row or column um, and this has to do if you write it down in, in so second quantized form it basically amounts to the number of terms which, which you have um, and there you can see that it starts to matter what your basis is and what the how, how the number of terms uh, grow with um, yeah with, you, with your volume so, um, and then there's a, there's a difference, even though uh, many problems which are more or less um, kind of local turn out to have um, matrices which are, which are formally sparse, which means, so sparse basically means that the, the number of, of these um, entries here on the line, they, they scale, do not attain a finite fraction of your Hilbert space dimension if you scale up the problem. So anything which is not, prop not exponential qualifies as sparse, but still there can be differences in the number of elements. And so if you, <coughs> um, there are two cases perhaps one, one can discuss. So if you have a, a lattice problem, um, we'd say um, spin, spin operator, so like a spin one half degree of freedom on each lattice side, um, th then basically, um, and you, you look at some kind of a, of an exchange term, something like, like a sigma plus, sigma minus um, on, on ij, on neighboring bonds, where this is i and this is j. So if you have a certain configuration, there will be fl a spin flip between nearest neighbors. But if your lattice is such that it has a finite number of bonds, which typically a graph, a graph has, then, um, then the number of terms in your, in your lattice, like the number of nearest neighbor bonds, will basically provide an upper bound to how many off-diagonal matrix elements there can be, because there are only, as no, the number number of bond time possibilities to exchange two spins and even in some spin configurations they are not allowed to flip so the, the number of entries will be smaller. But at least in, in short range um, Hamiltonian system this number of bonds is proportional to the physical volume or in the lattice problem to the number of sites so that's quite mild. Then we really have a have basically a situation where we have an exponentially large matrix but the number of often diagonal matrix elements is only proportional to the number of spins which which is um, a very modest, a very small number. Um, however, in the, in the phi to the four theory, um, if you write down uh, the Hamiltonian second quantization, um, basically in phi to the four, you have like a sum over uh, three independent momenta, um, and then you will hit with, with some bosonic creation or annihilation operators. It does, does not matter, but there is K1, K2, K3, and then here is the, is the sum. something that's such that they, add, they add up to zero. So you, here you see you have three independent momenta. So in principle, if you act with this Hamiltonian, if you count the number of terms, this is basically scales as the third power in the number of orbitals. And, and uh, so that's still a sub exponential, obviously, but it still makes a difference when you have some of the order of 10, 20 orbitals, whether you have 20 or 20 to the cube, that makes a difference, obviously, in the, in the number of matrix elements you actually have to calculate. So there are still formally sparse Hamiltonians, but of course there are qu quite, quite a, lot of, a lot of terms. And so <coughs> with, with, the, with this, uh, I can perhaps show you a bit what are the number... Um, oh, this is a surprise. <coughs> is there a third? No. To just give you an idea of what are the matrix matrix sizes one can achieve using current technology, which also involves um, more or less serious parallelization efforts. Um, so if, if you have uh, something like a, a spin problem, so a spin one half problem, which has, um, for example, a total AC conservation, which is like a U1, global U1 symmetry or something like that. Um, and you have lattice symmetries, because for example, you're working on a, on a periodic regular square lattice. Um, um, yeah, and say so, yeah, so U, U1 symmetry. So then, then in, like the, the, the total Hilbert space, um, for example, of, of 50 spins is something which is, which is uh, intractable, I, I would say. But if you, um, if you use this total U1 symmetry and you use the lattice symmetries, which 
For example, can you provide you up to like 200 discrete lattice symmetry operations, something like 50 translation, and also some point group operations. Th then you actually can boil this down to a few hundred um, billion. I think the simulations which, which we done is something like 3 times 10 to the uh, 11. So th these are now linear dimensions of the Hilbert space of, of problems which one can actually put on a supercomputer and, and calculate. Um, and so that's the, that's the linear dimension. So that's a linear dimension of the actual matrix problem, which one, one the non-trivial kind of connected part in which we believe the ground state is located. So we want to calculate the lowest energy. So that's like a matrix dimension which we can reach. And I think, <coughs> um, yeah, there might be other groups working on somewhat different problems where you can reach like 10 to the 12, but that's like the order of magnitude where I think just the computers become too small to go any further for the moment. But that tells you like between the 10,000 you can do on a laptop and at least using full complete diagonalization and what you can do for kind of uh, uh, tailored code for specific problems, th there are many orders of magnitude, at least in Hilbert space size. Unfortunately for these exponentially scaling problems, they usually do not translate in such an impressive a growth in the number of spins or something, but, but still, I mean, doing 50 spins is kind of a non-trivial um, result, even though it's far away from the thermodynamic limit. Um, now, if one <coughs> um, goes to, to Hamiltonians of, of this type here, um, where one either um, stores the matrix or one recalculates them on the fly, but then the iteration takes a long time, and one has to be a bit more modest, and I think what we, what we did uh, as kind of to look where the limits are. If you store the matrix for the phi to the four uh, theory in this one plus one dimensional setting, I think we can reach some, or we did something like of the order of um, 10 to the eight, so 100 millions. But um, so th that's where we store the matrix. And I think that's, yeah, that, that's uh, what one can do using not completely crazy uh, resources, but it's still already somewhat demanding. So that's for the, for the phi to the four. Uh, two-dimensional theory. If you store the matrix, um, one can do of the order of 10 to the 8 as the, as the Hilbert space. <coughs> so when you say not completely crazy resources, you mean your own cluster, the university cluster, or some supercomputer? Yeah, it de oh, depends how, how much resources your institute or department has. I mean, I mean these, these, I think these machines that I was running on, on, say, on the order of, say, 100 nodes or so, with, uh, where, where each node has like 64 uh, gigabytes or something, which, yeah, or, uh, it's not probably not a, not a department cluster typically of that size. So, so in my laptop, how far? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, on your laptop, I don't know how big your laptop is. It depends on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 ten to the three. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, not ten to the three. <laughs> I mean, if you store the matrix, I think on the, on the laptop, you, you perhaps you can do a few, a few hundred thousand or something. <coughs> I mean, we, in our code, we also have a version which does not calculate the, the matrix element. So in principle, we, we can, we're not memory limited necessarily. So we, uh, I think in a, I mean, actually this, this problem of the five to the four theory, at least on a formal level has some analogies to what people look at when they study fraction quantum Hall effects. So if you go to Landau orbitals and so on, you can write down Hamiltonians which look not exactly the same way, but which also have like four boson or four fermion terms and so on, but, but which are written in these spaces where you have to sum over many of the indices. And then you, um, you pre I mean, there were results like on, on in the few billion, so 10 to the nine or 10 to the 10, which are possible. But, but if you have a lot of these terms, like uh, having a number, kind of number of orbitals squared or the third power, it, it becomes a limiting factor, just the fact that, that there are a lot of matrix elements. <coughs> okay, but, but this gives you an idea, like if, you, if you're trying to work, work hard and you use some um, particular features of your problem, uh, I mean, there's more than, you, than you, what you can do just within, say, MATLAB or, or Mathematica. And, but these are like probably the orders of magnitude which you can which you can... Andreas, this 10 to the 8 states, are they a ba nice basis for the harm harmonic oscillators or what, what are yeah. you using there? Yeah, so, so here in this phi to the 4, this is... Um, so you level them by k, by the momentum? Yeah. And, and yeah, I mean, this, these are like really simple looking fox states. I mean, um, 
like there's like for example there's a representation I think you guys you use a similar I think there's like one, one part of the of the configuration stores the occupation of the, the the finite momenta going to the left there's a certain number of orbitals which which contain the occupations of the bosons in the in the branch going to the right and then there's a zero mode occupation so if you put numbers in here that specifies um, one, con one configuration in your Fox space. And the way it is done is basically each of these configurations has a certain energy, this H0, which we heard in the previous talk. And so you enumerate all of them, which are below a certain en total energy cutoff. And this is the basis which you keep. <coughs> yeah, OK. <coughs> so, so I think that was the, the blackboard part for the moment. So let us now look at, at some of the results which we um, have obtained. So the problem, um, I don't think I, I have to. <coughs> yeah, so let, let us just start with a very simple plot. And even though I'm going to show more than one uh, figure, I, I, I will take my time in, in order to explain what's really on the figure and you, you're encouraged to ask questions. <coughs> uh, okay, so, so we start here now, is, um, so we, we're interested in the, in the same problem as the, the speaker before. We're starting phi to the fourth here in one plus one dimension. So it basically means putting the theory on a periodic ring in space. Um, and as I just explained, there is like total momentum <coughs> of um, linear momentum along the ring is conserved and also the parity of the number of bosons um, that's like the even and the odd sector. And so, <coughs> um, so here we're taking a very uh, small uh, system, so the volume of one, which is extremely small, it's like 10 times smaller than some of the plots we have seen in the previous case. And here we're using, uh, so the coupling constant <coughs> here in this talk is called G4. It has the same role as, I think, as lambda before. It's just a coupling constant in the problem. And 0 0.1, so that's also very, very small. And so what is the purpose of this plot is, is to show the ground state energy, so that's E0, uh, the ground state energy. Um, and so this is just the, the offset um, with respect to some um, offset here. Um, and then these are the three uh, different uh, kind of uh, cutoff treatments which we use. And, and in terms of sophistication of the cutoff treatment, we did not go beyond what of the first paper of Lorenzo and, and Slava. <coughs> so the, the raw um, basically just means that we're, we're taking the, the truncated problem and do not care about about any sophisticated treatment. So just, that's just kind of the diagonalizing of HLL, I think it was called, uh, just the projection of the problem into the low energy subspace. Uh, and then these, these um, REN and subleading are, are two uh, kind of related versions to about this local um, um, renormalization. And so here, this is, this is now the, the, cut, uh, the, the ground state energy. And here we plot it um, as a, a range over E max. So E max is our cutoff um, in, in units of where the bare mass is, um, is one. And so here we actually do a scan over quite an extensive range of E max energies. And so just to tell you here, basically, we go up to 120, um, which has to do that at some point, we, the, the number of bosons which can which can be in the ground state, um, can be 120. So that's like one of the basis states which we consider is the state where, where there can be up to 120 bosons in the, in the, in the zero mode. I mean, it's not zero, but in the lowest, in the zero momentum mode, which is at energy one. Um, and so what, what, we, what you see here is basically is that the ground state energy um, itself, it does not have oscillations, but, but it actually um, stagnates in windows and then there is a somewhat abrupt change and it stagnates again and, and so on. And if you use these um, um, tr treatments of the local renormalization and so on, th then you, you see that the ground state energy um, at least is, is missing this, um, this um, significant trend, but however still uh, feels these uh, kind of abrupt uh, changes here. So there's some zigzag type of, of behavior, which um, whose ampl amplitude starts to damp out as you go to larger cutoffs. But 120 is actually a pretty large cutoff, I think, for the volu volume and the, and the coupling constant. But but it, it's it's to show, which is which was known to others, but it's just to show that even if you uh, use the, at least this level of cutoff treatment, there are, there are oscillations here uh, remaining, and one has to deal with them in some in some way. And I think the 
the, the procedure outlined by the previous speaker has, has um, addressed a nice way how to get rid of them and even keeping small Hilbert spaces. So the approach we're going to take is, uh, since we're not very sophisticated on that level, we're just uh, hitting harder in terms of, of e cutoff sizes and, and try to get meaningful results by extrapolating the cutoff, but using larger um, kind of cutoff for a given volume. Yeah, please. Can you identify which states cause these incredible jumps? Yeah, actually these, these blue lines, they, they are um, kind of the location. If you look into the, the non-interacting spectrum and you ask what kind of new um, matrix elements become active, then, then there are new states, I think, where you can put two bosons in which are just uh, hitting uh, below the new cutoff. So I think there are two, I think are states where you, you put two, two bosons in, uh, I think at finite momentum compensating because we're in the zero momentum sector and they, they become available and apparently have a, a non-negligible effect on, on it. Uh, actually, there's a, there's a second plot now where we, we look at this a bit more systematic. Andreas, yes. the first line looks variational. Yes. Um, is there anything to be said about variational aspects of this method? Yeah, I think that was discussed by the, by the previous speaker, uh, sorry. So, so uh, it, I think it's variational because you, you project the full problem into, into a subspace. Uh, and so that's what you get. I mean, this is, this is not the mass, but it's the, really the, the ground state en or the vacuum energy. This is um, supposed to be variational. But the, uh, the other treatments not, as, as, you, as you can see. Did you do anything special to the zero node, or was it here? No, it was really not, not fancy at all. No? The zero mode was, was, was just treated like any other mode. <coughs> so here this is just kind of a pedagogic um, reason. So what we do here is now we, uh, here in this plot, we actually do now a Fourier transform. So, I mean, that's like a simple reflex. If you have signals like that, where at least on this level where, where things are oscillating, you start to, to characterize this frequency and just analyze what they're doing. So here we, we keep uh, the coupling constant fixed, but we change the, the, the linear, the, the volume of the, of the problem. And so we can see here there's like one, one type of processes which I have identified, which apparently seem to scale. So you see these red, red plots. So there's, there are some frequencies which obviously depend on volume. Um, and also, and this is like a fixed volume, um, but here we, we change the, the G4 value. So if there is no, no G4, there are basically very small oscillations because they basically have zero kind of um, in, um, power spectrum. But as you increase G4, you, you can see there, are, there is some interesting structure popping up. I mean, first of all, there are some, some um, frequencies like here, but then also there are more important blobs developing. And actually also that's something which we also saw is that um, here we have low frequency uh, um, kind of oscillations and low frequency basically means these are like slow drifts. And so they are kind of uh, dangerous. So it's not, only, it's not only important to get drift of the oscillations, which we can clearly as identify as having a period, but there's also some long wavelength drift. I mean, long wavelength actually means like energy drift in the, in the cutoff. So one has to be careful about about that. And we did that actually in order to perhaps come up with a, with a good guess how to get rid of these oscillations. But, but when we saw this kind of too complicated um, spectrum, we, we said, okay, we don't care about it, we just extrapolate. And so that's what we, what we do here. <coughs> but I mean, it would be interesting to compare with, uh, with, with your method, whether if you do a similar analysis with a fine grid, in whether it, it, these structures are completely gone and you have really kind of um, taken care of, of the effects which, which, um, which produce these oscillations or not. Okay, so what we do now is, uh, okay, it's a slightly different volume, L equals three, uh, and the more substantial coupling, G4 equals one. Um, and now what we do is that we, you see we have still these three different type of result. Uh, and now we're also um, plotting the mass gap, which is the, the energy difference, the total energy difference between the vacuum energy in that volume <coughs> minus the energy of the first odd state. So the, as I said, there's a field parity in the problem. So we can calculate the first, um, kind of the, 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 the gap to the first excited state in the spectrum, which, which is at zero momentum, but in the odd, in the odd um, bosonic parity or particle uh, sector. <coughs> okay, so that's this quantity. And, and what we do now is that we, we have all these three different um, approaches. So like the, the raw, which is just the, the naive truncated version without any cutoff treatment. And then we have REN and subleading. Um, and now we're, we're plotting this as a function as one over the cutoff squared. Because this is like um, this one, um, 
behavior which you, which you anticipate might also have logarithmic corrections. But what we do here um, is, is um, scan um, up to quite large cutoffs. So here, I think for this problem, <coughs> we went to a cutoff which was close to 100 for this, um, for this volume, which are already sizable <coughs> Hilbert spaces, probably over about 10 million or so. Um, not 100, but I think of the order of 10 millions or so. Um, and so what we do is actually, since, um, since we, we can see that as you go to larger and larger um, cutoffs, the, the, the oscillations some actually start to decrease. So then we're actually fitting uh, with, um, I think with low order polynomials to these data in, in the window of, of the largest uh, cutoff values. So I think it's starting from this um, red or green line here. And then we're, we're looking at what, what, kind, what is the value of the mass gap we get after extrapolation in the, in the cutoff. And we try to somehow use conservative error bars. So actually, we, we define the error bar as being, as being the difference between the, the raw um, extrapolated result and the other one from the, the two more sophisticated method. And I mean, um, if you use this more sophisticated method, even beyond what we have done here, um, the hope would be that this would be more precise, but but our approach is actually to take rather small volumina and do an uh, extrapolation and actually then the error is really uh, quite small. And then based on, on rather well converged results in finite volume, we, we then try to do now a finite size analysis and, and somehow determine the critical point that way. <coughs> yes? I was going to ask how the renormalized things, um, uh, so you have a clear uh, Linear in so one over epsilon one over e squared uh, behavior for the raw results. Yes. So I was wondering what the result, of, what the Emax power is with which the renormalized results converge. It's greater than zero. Yeah, we, they basically end up having very small slopes, and I mean we're just fitting, I think, with linear or quadratic. I think they're just linear slopes here in that in that window. So it comes out that, that the, I mean, I think this, was, this is the, the purpose of this um, REN and subleading method is at least they, they get rid of these large, the, these large leading trend. They obviously do that job, but they do not get rid of the oscillations. And, um, and actually in many cases, at least if, if we're really an, at relatively small volume and at large cutoffs, then there is also no drift remaining. Because what is a bit worrisome in our experience is that if, if these two methods here, REN and subleading, start to differ, <coughs> then, then it's really, I think we do, would not trust extrapolations in a regime where at least already visually we see there's a di difference between these methods. And once the, the, these two methods give the same result, then we're more, we believe more that this extrapolation starts to make sense, but that's just empirical. <coughs> okay. Yeah, and this is um, this is just an illustration of, of what we what we get now. So now we we're keeping uh, fixed g4 value, which is of, of order, uh, which is one, I think, for this for this value. Um, and then we're calculating um, using this, this um, extrapolation procedure, which I've just shown, for L equals three, for example, we calculate the mass gap. And so this, this data point with its error bar is, um, is, is the result which we get after this extrapolation in the, in the cut, sending the cutoff to infinity. And then um, at this point, I think it has also been recognized by, by other authors. It's actually important if you want to learn something about the thermodynamic limit, it's actually important that, that um, kind of the, the simulations you do um, are, are taken, uh, take care of these um, Abel Plana corrections from the normal ordering, whether your normal ordering in finite volume or in, in infinite volume makes a difference. And so we had to learn that first, that this makes it, I mean, it's obvious that it makes a difference, but, but the finite size scaling behavior is actually rather irregular if you do not take that into account. So even if you do very rid ridiculous volum volumina of one, for example, I mean, they start to make sense also with the rest of the L's, if you take the Abel Plana corrections um, into, into account. And then you get rather nice um, formulas, which you then can also fit to Lüscher formulas for what is the finite volume behavior of the mass gap for massive uh, theories. And so here, here you see the, the fit over the range of L, which we look at. And typically, we're going to see that later, typically we're, um, we, we can trust our results also closer to the critical point for, for, volu uh, for volumes, which are like four, four up to five. I think for, for six and beyond, it seems that we are not able to really get very, caref uh, very <coughs> accurate results. But, but as we will show, um, doing a very careful job at, at smaller volumes, uh, and using finite size, uh, analyzing the regular finite size behavior, we're still able to actually get, uh, I think, pretty accurate results. 
And so that's what we try to illustrate um, here. So this is now our attempt at determ the determ determination of the critical point. So here, uh, I think what is a bit different to other studies, at least in the Hamiltonian truncation um, uh, business, is that we're using se several different proxies in order to, to, to locate our critical point. So th the first one which we're using here, um, that's, um, that's basically uh, based on CFT input. So we expect that the critical point is an... Um, is an Ising CFT, so we know the spectrum of scaling dimensions. We know that in this geometry in which we're simulating at the critical point, we should find the spectrum of the Ising CFT. So, so we are using the, the criterion to determine the, the finite size critical point. It's basically the coupling value where L divided by 2 pi times the mass at this system, at this L, um, um, attains crosses the value of 1 over 8. Because if you look at the finite, the, the, the behavior of the mass gap, um, on a, um, where you plot here G4 for, for a kind of the mass gap uh, for a fixed volume here, uh, then basically it goes down and it has, it has such a behavior. Uh, and we are basically just saying, okay, if you multiply this with L times divided by 2 pi, and then you, you check where, whether this, when you, when you reach this point here, and that gives you the kind of for this L, the critical point in G4. Um, and so these are this collection of of, of red, red points. So you can see you can do that even for, for um, volumes of one, which I think one would probably believe this is nonsense to look at so small, but actually they're part of a, of a rather regular family of points. And you can also see, I mean, at small volumes, this crossing is determined quite ac ac uh, accurately. And as we go to large and larger volumina, our extrapolation procedure becomes somewhat more fuzzy, but there's still, still a window where this crossing is rather well defined. And if the volumes get to, to like five or six, our error becomes larger. But, but based on this crossing um, finite size critical point, we are already quite um, in a quite uh, a small window. You see this is 2.7, this is 2.8. Um, and it gets a bit cr crowded, but these are various different points with error bars from the literature. And I think the, the point where we're converging here, which is looks quite nice, at least based on this proxy here, is, is actually really within the most, I think by now, the most accurate method, like the most um, kind of sophisticated Hamiltonian truncation uh, study. And also I think the MPS result is quite accurate and the, and the most recent Monte Carlo results. You, you can see that these, these results actually clot, um, uh, cluster around here, bit, say at uh, 2.76 or 77, I think that's the current. And I think our results here um, come pretty close to that and are confirming that, that even um, from this approach. But then we're also doing some, some other things which are less accurate, but which are in agreement. So for example, if you look at here at a larger um, window of, of G4 values, and this is also one over L squared, we're looking for a different um, primary field of the CFT. So we can ask where it, it's not the same mass gap, it's a mass gap for the first kind of even, even state at zero momentum. So that one should have scaling dimension one. So we're basically tracking this, this finite size critical point and so th this is way off on a given system size, this is way off, but, um, but this has a large finite size effect, but it's compatible to actually go, and here you can see it, it's very steep, but it's compatible with this point which we have here. So we're not claiming that this is more accurate, but at least it's not, in, it's not going to a, a wildly different, so in that sense, at least it's, it's supporting that this, this estimate here is, um, is reasonable and it's not contradicted by the analysis of, a diff of the crossing with a different, um, Primer, uh, kind of a CFT field. Uh, and another one which is also I think popular in, in whatever condensed matter or statistical mechanics is to actually take two different uh, volumes. So here volume is continuous. Uh, I think in, in lattice models one would typically use two different system sizes, um, lat a number of lattice sites, but then you, you basically look for um, kind of for, for the gap to, to go as one over L. So you, you check whether this is this convert without imposing a value. Um, so th this, um, since we be typically take pairs of Ls which are just by one length unit away from each other, this, this crossing together with the error bars which we have on the extrapolated mass gaps um, are much, uh, have a much uh, larger uh, kind of um, um, error bar. But, but still, if you look at the data points, they actually uh, seem to converge coming from the other side and also are approaching the same, the same value. So these are th three different 
uh, approaches uh, as three different kind of finite size critical points, but they all seem to go to the same critical point, and which is, I think, which is among the most precise um, modern uh, determinations of the critical point in this uh, phi to the four uh, theory. <coughs> then we also have have had a look as others at the at the critical energy spectrum. So we here we also include some states at finite momenta, um, and so the circles, which are sometimes are hardly visible, this is the expected Ising CFT results for a torus spectrum, um, and the, the field data points with the error. These are um, extrapolated um, results, and so you can see that the, the CFT tower of the, of the torus is is rather well reproduced by the <coughs> by this um, truncated um, Hamiltonian approach. Um, but much better for than for other studies because usually usually it's not easy to reproduce this. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it would be interesting to see how you manage to get it. Okay, and as, as I said uh, before, we also looked at uh, a different observable, which is the, the central charge. So the, since we, we expect that the, the theory uh, of the critical point is a, is a CFT with central charge C equal one half. So what we do is that, that um, for, for the whole range of G4 values shown here, we're, we're actually looking at the, the energy density, so the vacuum energy density uh, divided by which means the total vacuum energy density divided by the by L, the volume, and this is expected to have quadratic in L corrections, which are proportional to the central charge. So what we basically do is that here, for example, um, like one color of data set uh, for a data set includes a, a certain range of L values, um, and then within these L values we calculate the ground state energy density um, and and uh, fit the linear slope to the, to the data. Um, and the error bar is just some kind of, um, of indication of the quality of the fit. Um, and then we're just plotting that. So it's a, it's a result which depends on the, the, the series of system sizes you're looking at. And, um, and of, of course, if you're in the, in the kind of in the massive phase here, um, um, there is no central charge. So it is a pro the volume, the, the, the vacuum energy density should converge exponentially. So ultimately, this, this quantity for large volumes should actually go to zero. And indeed, you see if you take 2 to 6, 3 to 6, 4 to 6, 5 to 6, you can see that somehow the trend is going down. So this is not co converging to a, to a finite uh, number. Um, and then uh, one, one has to look at this, re at this regime here. And so I, unfortunately, I did not remove the last set because it really shows that at some point results do not get precise. But if you just focus on the one, the, the, the systems which are smaller and where the cutoff extra extrapolation is more accurate, uh, you, you can really see there's a, this effective C is increasing. It has a maximum here. And if you uh, go to larger um, volumina here, th then you can actually see that it, it nicely um, converges to a maximum here, which is um, which here this dotted line is, is 0.5. So that's the expected central charge of that CFT. So that actually looks quite nice. So if you disregard the red curve, it's quite nice. And so what you can do here is um, measure, for example, uh, locate the maximum. And so these are, uh, I think the, the pink one is the Monte Carlo results. And I think this um, brown, I think is your most recent determination. So we can see that the maximum, also the crossing here of the derivative, it crosses zero, is really well within the error bars of the other approaches. And this is a, a confirmation that, not, which is not a surprise, but we see the spectrum, but also the central charge in this approach is, is correctly um, reproduced. <coughs> okay, yeah, and then, um, just to kind of show that the technology is there, we also uh, dared to, to look into two plus one dimensions. Uh, but this is very preliminary, so this is not meant to be any, any type of state-of-the-art calculation. But it's just shown that, that one can, in principle, do that from the kind of Hilbert space construction and the matrix element calculation point of view, which is, which is simple, but still it's, um, it's a little bit of work. So what we're doing here, just for illustration purposes, is that we're, we're looking at, uh, so we're taking the same basis, um, a free basis for mass one, um, and we're actually uh, quantizing the theory on a two-dimensional torus, which basically means now, and a, a torus of aspect ratio one, which basically means that the grid of k points which we have now lie on a, on a square lattice in momentum space, and in principle is unbounded in all direction, and that's like the, um, at least the, the grid of k points for a two-dimensional square torus. Um, 
And then, okay, and then we start filling up states, and then we have a small cut of uh, Emacs of 10 or of 15. And uh, the perturbation which we apply now is a simple mass perturbation. So we just add, add a, a phi square term with a certain uh, G2 value. And that problem is obviously exactly solvable. But within the approach, it becomes slightly non trivial. And so here we're looking within a certain uh, sector at the dependence of the, the truncated results, which are the black and the red. Um, symbols and uh, the green one are the exact lines in that sector and so you, you can see for small perturbation there are reasonable results and at least here you can see that that if you increase the cutoff at least there's a trend that going from black to red you converge towards the correct result. Um, of course this is a, a, a trivial theory where there's nothing to be learned apart from the fact that there are truncation effects and they seem to go away as we increase the cutoff but that, as a um, uh, Juan uh, um, explained there is a problem if you want to apply the phi to the fourth theory to this problem there are um, kind of uh, problems with UV divergences in various uh, sectors and we also did look at uh, we also put the, the phi to the four perturbation in this but then weird things happen because then within a, a certain cutoff if you start to increase uh, G4 there's suddenly like abrupt uh, kind of changes in the ground state wave function and it seems to us that, that suddenly the ground state um, wave function lifts has a lot of population, I mean, populates a lot of states which are at, at the at the cutoff and so on. So there are weird things happening. But it seems that this might be a finite, like a, a Hamiltonian truncation um, phenomenon, which might be related to these kind of um, problems of UV divergences in the in the approach. But it, and it would clearly be, or it's clearly required that one has that one has some field, field theoretical input in how to cure this problem and in, in order to make that a, a kind of a working method for two for two plus one um, dimensions. So yes? How big was your Hilbert I think it was really very small. So this is just a, a demonstration calculation. This was not an attempt at being accurate. <coughs> I, I would have to look it up, but I don't know how large it is. OK. The congratulations, the first 3D Hamiltonian truncation calculation. Yeah, I think there are some stochastic results available, but. <laughs> no, but uh, not, not the widest. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I will already liable. Okay. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> yeah, so if there are no, no more questions on, on that part, I, I just would like to briefly show you some results on the for lattice models on on torus energy spectrum. It, because I mean it's kind of it's kind of related because if, if for example you choose I mean there are different ways to choose the K the momentum base is here now if you if you take a square torus that's what we did but of course you can also quantize the, um, these field theories on a sphere i think that's what field theoretical or minded people would would do more often we're more coming from lattice models so that a torus is more familiar to us but say if, if you were able to to put that program to work and go to the interacting uh, fixed point of of the uh, 3d icing model in that formulation what is kind of the spectrum which we would expect on the on the torus <laughs> Um, so here it's a, it's, a, it's a choice among many because you we choose the torus, but we could also have chosen the sphere. But if you're simulating lattice models, and, and we, we have heard there are very sophisticated numerical approaches, at least to, to uh, assess many observables in these in 2D, it, uh, we thought it would be interesting to explore how torus energy spectra um, actually look like. So I think here I can skip this a bit. So what is the... What is the motivation? Since I mean, since there are people from different topics, I I just would re would like to to mention that something which is well known to many, but perhaps not to all of of the people in the audience, is that if you're looking at the one D uh, problem, uh, kind of the space time, you put it on a line, so that's the space part, the the blue line, and here you have time, so it's like a cylinder. Um, and so there's a mapping between the kind of the R2, the, the complete plane to this. Um, and what is nice um, is that basically the scaling of the, the, that the energies of your Hamiltonian problem, which you're solving on the line, is actually uh, directly telling you, this, giving you the spectrum of scaling dimensions of, of the CFT. And I always found that very fascinating that by doing poor man ED on, on lattice models, I'm actually able to and not only me, but others also to actually uh, kind of uh, look really into the, the we have a window into the CFT and see all these towers of things that I find that very fascinating. And so the question was, what happens in, in, in uh, higher dimensions? In higher dimensions, there is still a conformal mapping from R to the D to something, but that something is actually the, the S 
the d minus one dimensional sphere times r. So if you want to, to have the property that the Hamiltonian um, energy spectrum gives you the energy spectrum uh, kind of translates into the spectrum of scaling dimensions, you have to quantize your, your uh, problem on the sphere. But actually, if you start writing down, for example, a transverse fieldizing model as a lattice model discretization on the sphere, you have all kinds of problems because the lattice, I mean, you cannot triangulate the sphere in a regular way. There are defects, they, co they correspond to curvature, so that you, and it's difficult to get rid of them. So it's not easy for kind of lattice model minded persons to actually do simulations on the sphere. So it has some interest to actually understand what's going on on the torus. But the problem is that the two torus, so where you have two space dimensions, uh, that space dimensions wrapped up in a torus times R, I mean, it, it, this is not the same as the sphere. And so the question I think is open or was open to what extent um, the energy spectrum of, a, of an interacting uh, CFT fixed point looks on a torus as compared to the sphere where due to the conformal bootstrap and so on, we, we now have a very impressive knowledge about the spectrum of, of low-lying scaling um, dimensions. And so what we were, were doing is to, to actually calculate numerically energy spectra on, on tori. Um, so we were asking whether this, there's a universal low energy spectrum, and of course it is, there is, um, but also the question whether it's actually accessible numerically or whether it could also be that it's just too hard with the available methods to actually get, get kind of um, results which are not finite size effects but really uh, kind of field theoretical results. And then if it's accessible how it looks like, and also at least from, I find that curious to understand whether there's any kind of analogy or at least or some visible resemblance between the, the spectrum of scaling dimensions on the sphere and on the torus. <coughs> yeah, so I think now I, I, I speed up a little bit. So what we were doing in the first part is, is taking an actual lattice model, so the transverse field dicing model on different lattices and um, using exact diagonalization and also complemented by quantum Monte Carlo results, we were able to access some of the low-lying gaps. And so this is just to show you how an actual spectrum of such a lattice um, looks like, so here is the coupling constant, and so here you have different energy levels for different system sizes in some sectors, so the question was a bit how to get something useful out of, of this whole mess. Um, and so this is now uh, some finite size scaling results. Um, so the, the situation is that we're looking at the square torus, and this has been obtained by, by taking um, a square lattice, uh, kind of a microscopic square lattice of up to 40, 40 spins spin one half degrees of freedom, and then, so this one over n is one over the, the number of lattice sites. And, and here, what we're doing is um, we're, we're focusing on certain symmetry sectors in our, in, our, um, micros in our spectrum, like the zero momentum sector, and the full and the empty symbols, they correspond to Z2 um, even and odd um, levels. Uh, and the blue ones are at zero momentum. Here you see the, the corresponding k-space grid, so the, the center is the blue uh, part, and the, the green one is the first momentum off, so like 2 pi over L, if you, if you want. Um, and then we're doing, so we, we calculate this, so the, 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 the non-red uh, symbols are from exact diagonalization, and the red symbols here, they are, um, is one set of gaps which is available from, from quantum Monte Carlo. And so you can see by using a, a, a phenomenological one over n scaling um, and, and renormal setting the first non-vacuum non level to, to one, we actually see there is quite a regular um, finite size scaling behavior, and then the extrapolated values here so these, these blue ones and the, the, the red ones, we associate them to, to be like the, the CFT spectrum on that particular uh, torus. <coughs> um, and then we, we actually did the, that game on the number of different lattices. So there's another lattice which is not important what it is, but it's different microscopic from the square lattice. It's called the square octagon. And if you do the same analysis on this on a range of, um, so this, this model has a different critical points because some sites have a different um, a coordination number. So the microscopically it's a different model. It has a different uh, critical point, but, but the torus energy spectrum on the square torus for these simulations actually uh, tend to give the same results within some numerical um, error. And then if you actually put the theory on a different torus, um, which is one which basically the, the unit cell is something like a hexagon, um, which means it basically the torus has a different modular parameter, then we see there's, there's some small difference in the sense that the, the torus energy spectrum has some dependence on the, the shape of the torus. Um, 
But, but first of all, from these numerics, it seems that we're able to extract something which seems to be a stable spectrum, um, which hopefully is something which corresponds to the spectrum of a, of a particular um, CFT. And, and then we... The previous plot, sigma t always is 1.00. Yeah, that physical is a choice of normalization. No, that's a choice of normalization. Because since we're simulating lattice model, our speed of light is not, is not known beforehand. And, and um, in some of the plots, we actually made an attempt via different means to, to determine the speed of light, the kind of the, uh, and then we can renormalize it and, and get it out. But otherwise, we, we just, um, here in these plots, we, we just choose, we set the first level to one and rescale the whole spectrum that way. Yes. A natural guy to look at, excited state, would be the stress tensor, the one corresponding to stress tensor with momentum two, I guess, or. No, here it's angle momentum two. So we were looking for that, but but it's actually not on that plot. I mean, we were looking for traces of the stress energy tensor, but I think it's quite high up in the spectrum. Yeah, and it also it splits up because on the square lattice, um, like um, the L equals two of the sphere, which has is like five. Uh, representation of dimension five, it splits up into several um, um, representations of the, of the symmetry group of the square torus. So it's a bit a delicate business uh, what actually happens, but we were looking for it, and, but it's not on this. So would that have given you the, the speed of light in a natural way? But it's not I think it's not, it's not known at what location in energy it is. <coughs> I think it's not as, as simple. No, what you typically can do is basically something like that. Sorry, I, I didn't understand the but there's no state operator map as it says. So what no, there is not, but you, you would expect, well, I mean, he's but getting... But you, you can just ask, like, where is the first state which at least quantum number-wise could be a remnant of the stress energy tensor? I mean, it's, uh, Th There is no state it's of a state operator correspondence, but he's labeling all the state with the operator, so that's why. Right, you, you are labeling, labeling the low energy state with... Yeah, but I, I, will, I, will, show, I will show why, why I dare to do that, I mean... Uh, <laughs> no, no, I mean, people uh, insist that this, there's no map, and I know, but, but I still think, um, I will show you in a, in a second, I still think, uh, at, least, uh, at least for educational purposes, it might still be good to actually remember that what, what, you, should you, what you expect on the sphere and what do you get on the torus, it's not wildly different, at least for the low-lying part. One, one can then debate whether that's a useful <laughs> kind of a comparison to make, but I, at least I find that uh, curious. Okay, so he, here we, we, um, we then teamed up with, with uh, Seth Witzet, who's a student of Subir Sachdev, and they performed some, at least in my opinion, sophisticated um, epsilon expansion um, results, so four minus um, epsilon, um, so com coming from the, the free uh, fixed point, um, and calculating the torus spectrum in this epsilon expansion. And so here, here you see results for two different modular parameters, so basically the situations we looked at, the square tori, and the, the one with the hexagonal unit cell, which we, we called triangular in these plots here. Um, and so here we actually um, calculated the speed of light, so, so now it's taken into account. Um, and then you, you can see that um, the, the squares are epsilon expansion results, and the, 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 the circles are exact diagonalization QMC, ex finite size extrapolated uh, results. And then we, we see that, um, I mean, they are not uh, accurate to, to many digits, but on the, on the level of diversity of where the levels are, the agreement uh, on the respective locations between the extrapolated numerics and the epsilon expansion, which also has, a, has an error, I guess, but we don't know how large it is. But at least uh, this comparison between two methods which don't know uh, nothing about each other um, seem to to give a reasonable account of what is the type of low energy spectrum which you expect for the Ising uh, CFT in two plus one dimension on a, on a torus of two, two different uh, modular parameters. <coughs> yeah, and then, um, and it's just, just to, to give you an idea, so if you, that's the way we, where we plot our torus data, and that's a synthetic plot which I made based on conformal bootstrap results and my understanding of how that would look like on the sphere. So this is not an actual calculation, this is like a, a model. Um, so I, I take the scaling dimensions which are known from conformal bootstrap and then say what, what are like the towers which you would expect based on derivatives and so on. So that's the spectrum which you would expect on the, on the, on the sphere. <coughs> Okay, and then, I mean, here, here that's the plot which perhaps at least show you why, why I think it's instructive to make this, um, this comparison. So here the O1 is actually the Ising CFT, which we did just discussed. And so here on the left, to the right of this dotted line, there is the, the, um, the ED and, the, and the, um, the epsilon expansion results, so that's on that side here. And then we also explored the O2. Um, 
critical point in some lattice model and O2 in the, in the epsilon expansion and O3 as well. So here we have, a, have like a list of the first uh, fields, the first uh, fields popping up at zero momentum in, in those theories um, and, and um, kind of labeled by kind of the charge they have under the global symmetry. So here it's even and dot and for O2 you have like a, a linear angular momentum and here you have like the O3 re representation. So the different colors are different angular momentum channels of, of two and three. And then what we, what we took is the scaling dimensions from, from the literature which basically means conformal bootstrap and here we have to chosen to actually renormalize them um, that we put the epsilon field, so the thermal field, we set them to one in these units um, and then we actually see that, that relative to each other they actually, I mean it's not, I'm not saying this is an exact statement but I find it more more than, than just the coincidence that, that these levels here, so that's like the scaling dimension of the, of the icing, the true scaling dimension of the icing CFT compares rather well at least within some limits um, and yeah, and, and the same is true here for these other different uh, fields which we have. So there's, there's often a, a, good, a good agreement, at least on some, on some um, level. And, uh, and I say, I mean, as I, I know there is no exact uh, state uh, operator mapping, so there's no, it's not expected that these things coincide. But, but for us, or at least for me, um, if one is looking at the numerical um, a problem, say, of a, of a complicated CFT where the torus spectrum is not known and I, I would like to know what, what should I look for if I have no other idea, then I think it's fair to say I should look up what you guys or some other people did in terms of what is the operator content of a theory and then I would actually go forward and see whether in my torus spectrum I'm actually able to identify some, at least some of the fields or um, in the which I would expect might show up in the torus even if I know, don't know them beforehand. So at least there is a, there is a, a phenomenological or an empirical idea what I, I personally would look for, whether that's true in all the cases we don't know, but it might be that someone uh, finds out at least what, how, to what extent um, the, the scaling dimensions on the sphere get distorted, how wildly how wild things can happen, we don't know. I mean, the, there are things happening, they are not the same, but still it's, it's remarkable that they at least match to within some, so there's some loose correspondence, it seems. Um, and just um, without going to the detail, I'm just, we're looking for some other motivation, we were looking at this, a slightly more complicated microscopic model. And so this is now really a calculation where we had some motivation to study a microscopic model and we want to understand the critical behavior of that model. So the particular model is a, is a quantum ashkin teller model. Um, I mean, I think I skipped the details. If you want to know, I can tell you. But there are basically some, in, some um, coupled icing models with a transverse field. Um, and depending on the couplings, you actually have really two microscopically decoupled transverse field icing models or, or um, you, you start coupling them. And the question is what the phase diagram looks like. Um, and so uh, this was a complementary approach. On one hand, we did a, a quantum Monte Carlo study on that uh, particular um, quantum Ashkin Teller model. Um, and so if, if the, there's a certain microscopic coupling here, if you tune that to zero, it's, as I said, it's just two different uh, two um, Ising models. And if you drive them with a transverse field, um, there are just two, two copies of an Ising model undergoing a, an, an Ising transition. But then if you start to couple the two Ising models, um, it actually seems that there, there is a, a 3D XY transition here. So, so the number of phases is like this one large uh, phase here, which is paramagnetic. Uh, there is one here where, um, where symmetries are, are broken on both sublattices. And here there is one, one situation where only one of the two sublattices is ordered and the other one is disordered. So this is known, I think, both from the, the structure of some um, two component phi to the fourth theory with some cubic anisotropy. So the phase diagram qualitatively is not a surprise as such. I mean, for quantitatively for that particular model, it has had to be determined. Uh, but, but one point which I would like to point out is that here along this line here, um, um, you see this is an XY transition, but if you look at the, the broken symmetries, it's not that the problem has a continuous symmetry, but there's some emergent XY uh, critical point, even though the microscopic model actually has these cubic anisotropies, which are non-zero, but these are dangerously <coughs> irrelevant perturbations. Um, and so, for example, if you go along these lines, if you cross along this line, in some cases you find a situation where where the, the broken symmetry states have peaks in these histograms in the corner of the square and here, here there are on the, on the main axis. 
axis. Um, so there's, a, there's something happening and you can associate that that somehow the, the sign of the cubic anisotropy uh, changes and so there are different minima chosen. And what I would like to point out is that there is some evidence that you can actually see that in the torus spectrum as you cross this line. And the point is that if you look um, so what is shown here is that this is the, the torus spectrum at the decoupled limit, which you can understand from the torus spectrum of one copy and you just kind of take the product of the two theories and you, you, you can understand that. Uh, and so here this is now is a simple exact analyzation results on rather small lattices. But what you, what you can see here is that, that the levels at the Ising theory, they, they start to, to rearrange along that line. So th this is like a coupling value of 2.5, 3 and 3.8. Sorry, um, so these are like different points along this line here and we're looking at the spectrum at the critical point. And, um, and the point I would like to make is that here, for example, these levels, we set them to one and they are exactly degenerate by symmetry. But here you can see um, that, that um, the levels like the, the triangle and the circle, they are split in some way that the triangle is on top then here they cross and here they are ordered the other way around. And uh, I, I don't have an analytical argument, but I, I tend to believe that, that uh, this distortion of the spectrum is not just some random finite size effect, but if one actually does something like, like a kind of um, uh, something like conformal perturbation theory, one would probably see that the finite size spectrum of such a theory, if there's a dangerously irrelevant operator of the type like, like this perturbation, it would probably mean that they are split in one direction if the, if the sign is one way and it splits the other way. And so using ED, I, I pretend to say that we can actually locate where the point is where this, at least the leading dangerously irrelevant operator is actually a changing sign. And so that might be one of the applications where by looking at torus spectrum, you can actually learn something about rather subtle questions which are not so easy to actually analyze even with, with quantum Monte Carlo because sometimes you need very large volumes. But in spectroscopy it could be that some subtle questions could, could possibly be answered by looking at, at careful analysis. But of course this needs to have a, a quantum field theoretical background otherwise it's just speculation. But, but it's, it's at least in one dimension there are very prominent examples where you can see for example, perturbations by marginal operators, they lead to splitting of, of CFT multiplets. And if, if this marginal operator is vanishing, you can see that the multiplet is restored. So these things are well established in 1 plus 1D. And it would be interesting to understand whether similar results, of course, not in the same beauty, but at least things like that could be, could be have a, a, a theoretical foundation. Okay, and with this, I come to the end and I would like to acknowledge my collaborators. So the first part on the five to the four theory was a, a master student project which I did together with Christoph Pernul. So he did um, a lot of the work there on the numerical simulation parts. And the part on the on the, the torus spectrum which, which is published was a collaboration between Michael Schuler, who's a PhD student in my group, Louis Paul Henry who was a postdoc in my group and, and the epsilon expansion result as I mentioned were obtained by the Harvard um, by Subir and his, his student. And the, the last part on the, on the quantum Ashkin Taylor model, that's a, an in house um, project with Michael and with Louis Paul. And with this, I would like to thank you all for your attention. <laughs> Thanks, Andreas. Lots of questions. Yes, please. Could you go back to the slide for the uh, large, the infinite volume limit for 5 4? There was one result on there that you didn't comment on. I just wanted to comment. Um, so which which one? Um, For the large volume, the, the large volume limit of five four. You were doing the extrapolations for different methods. Ah, uh, for the critical point. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's an entry there for DLCQ that you didn't mark about. Um, we'll be talking about that on Thursday. DLCQ is way down below the one point five there. I think this one here, yeah? Yeah, it's that triangle sitting there that, that seems inconsistent with all the other calculations. Yeah, that's, that's true, yeah. Yeah, we think we at least qualitatively understand the difference there. I'm not sure if everyone's aware, but we'll be talking about that on Thursday. Okay. Can I also ask to, to go to this slide where you show the, the weight of each... Uh, state in the ground sequence function? I, I think I didn't understand that. Ah, no, that's just the Fourier transform of the, of the dependence of the gap as a function of, or here, uh, this one. Yeah. Yes. 
what, what is this FM, this little M? Uh, this is this is the, just the, the frequency. So we, we consider this signal, or I, I don't know whether it's the gap or the ground state energy dependence, but but we're looking at, at data of that type, um, and then we, we just want to understand what is the oscillation. I mean, here it's kind of clear we have already identified, but this is something where basically only a thi single event is happening. But if you go to larger uh, interactions or larger volumes, I mean, th these oscillations are much more messy. They are not as nice stair steps as here. And so this was an attempt to take this data and just Fourier transform it and, and let the Fourier transform tell us where the... In, in, in the energy. Yeah, in the energy, so... But do you have an idea which type of states... Yeah, I think he, here... Or the ground state of the interaction? Yeah, he, here it's really, I mean, you can understand it by perturbation theory, I guess. No, I mean, here you at least in finite volume with a finite cutoff, th there is like a regime where the perturbation, is, I mean, the, the interaction is so weak that, that you can just do finite size perturbation theory. So you understand like how is your wave function dressed? And then it turns out that there are just some, some matrix elements of the complete second quantized Hamiltonian which are not allowed in, in this setup with your truncation. And if you shift, if you shift one of the if you shift your cutoff, then suddenly there are terms available or becoming possible. And so the, the, here, this, bl this blue result is, is one, one uh, these, these lines here, there are one, caress, one type of process which we have identified. I'm, I'm not sure, I think I said something, uh, it could be that there's a new way to put in two more bosons or something like that, um, while respecting the, the, the fact that it's an even sector and that you have, um, you have to have zero momentum. But, but as you can see here, there are, there are more I mean, this, the situation is more complicated as you, as you go to la larger interactions. So it's not just a one sim single process. But that was what I hope initially, that if there were, were like a very clear oscillation structure, which you we could just fit the oscillations because we have understood what their origin was and then get rid of them by just eliminating them. Um, but that, it was not that... If you could, for example, distinguish, is it more important to go to high momenta but with low occupation numbers or with two high occupation numbers but still with low momentum? With which type of state is more <coughs> important to represent uh, the ground state? Is there an intuition for that? Or? No, I don't have a simple enough intuition to, to like convey it to you. But in our work we studied this question and definitely low occupation number, high momentum is more important. Yeah. So, so you think this peaks is just like uh, Andre is saying, just two states, so but with high moments. So this suggests that one should perhaps introduce different cutoffs in different occupation number sectors. But okay, this has been an idea has been around for a while, but I don't think it has been implemented yet by anyone. But it also depends a bit on the regime you, you want to go, probably. It could be that at small interactions, these effects are more important, which you mentioned. But on the other hand, if you want to go into the symmetry broken case, at some point it also becomes clear that somehow the basis is really not appropriate to somehow uh, describe a distorted harmonic oscillator. Uh, I guess, I mean, at some point, the zero mode also becomes important, I guess. And uh, I, mean, there were, I think there were papers looking at zero, having this mini Hilbert space of the zero mode in addition, that might also help in some cases. But it's. Yeah, we don't have an understanding where to say like what is the the simplest thing you should improve. There are a lot of things to improve, uh, but but at least here there's an analysis. And I mean, mm -hmm. oh. also in this plot you work in very small volume, right? So even the zero momentum state has a large contribution. Yes. You work in bigger physical volume, then the gaps are probably not as extreme. Yeah, but but I think what is one of the of the messages at least in this approach where we where we do kind of what was. Um, um, introduced like two, three years ago in this cutoff treatment. I think what the bottom line is, we, I mean, of course we can set up the computer and run simulations for L equals 10, and we can also try to extrapolate, but it somehow seems that these results are unreliable. I mean, we can do it, they get energies, but I don't think they are useful in like advancing our, the precision of these results. So I think the, the approach we have taken after some exploration is to, to, to really stick with very small volumes, but to do them very carefully and somehow try to do the un a finite size results. I think, I think you showed results for L equals 10, and I think you get reason, I think we cannot do that. For L equals 10, um, we, we, okay, we get also large Hilbert spaces, but I think the quality of the results is really not good. So I think for this approach here, it's really important to be modest with volume, but to do a careful job at small volume. And if there's a su substantial, I mean, a well-developed finite size behavior, then we're actually able to, to track that. But it's better to do a careful job at small volume than do a sloppy job at large volume, and then it's not the volume which saves you. 
I mean, here's a question. Yeah, I just said, so just to get a little bit of a sense, then, so how many states do you think you, you've converged the energies for? I mean, you've talked a lot about the ground state of the system or the first excited state. I mean, how many states do you think are kind of within 10% error or have converged? I, I just want to have some sense of the, of the uh, reach of the method, right? I mean, I think the CFT spectrum, which we showed, probably gives at least a a lower limit to that. So I, I think, yeah, but okay, that's right, like roughly like 10 states or so. Okay. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, I think I, I personally have some more questions, but I, I restrict myself and I suggest <laughs> others to also restrict and so that we can proceed. We can thank Andreas and we can proceed to the cocktail. Okay.